Okay, now we are live streaming on YouTube also. That's fantastic. And uh, uh, let's start. Stephanie, can you please let us know who is the first uh, company going ahead? Sure, so first we have Samurai Velocity. Very good. And then before I start, uh, 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 Hamid, they, we had a long discussion about your background. They have looked at, looked at what you're doing. So the reason I'm not introducing, the, you're, you're more, more well-known than need introduction and they really went through it. So they already know about your background, but it would be great when, when you answer the questions also mention more about what you do and what the company does. Really appreciate great. it. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Samurai. Yes. So our team's name is Samurai Velocity. We have team members from India, Kenya, Oman, and Palestine. And you can know more about us on our website. This is the QR code and the URL. So now I'm going to talk about our best product, which is bamboo for carbon removal. So right now, the world's biggest problem is carbon emissions from fossil fuels for uh, electricity production. You can see this graph here, which shows the spike in the carbon emissions just because of uh, burning of fossil fuels. So our solution is a grass that can power your house and reduce CO2. And that grass is bamboo. But why bamboo? Bamboo is a grass, so it won't die when its stalks are trimmed. Its seeds are cheaper, it adapts to the climate, and it has higher yield. I'll tell you why these points are important in a few minutes. And most importantly, it releases 30% more oxygen than trees. So now I'll show you the simulation of our idea in polyup. So in our, uh, so a drone plants bamboo and uh, waters them using a seed and water dispenser. And then this is a solar powered drone. So this drone plants bamboo for a biomass plant to generate electricity. So I told you before that bamboo has a unique characteristic where uh, if you kill, if you uh, trim the upper stalks, it won't die. So that uh, principle is being used here to take the bamboo to the storage facility and use it to produce electricity. So in the biomass factory, first the bamboo are used to heat the water on top of it and convert it into steam. So this is the steam tank. This From the steam tank, it is sent to turbines which help generate electricity and then it's sent to a generator from the generator it's then sent to the grid and then it's sent to all the houses and so now i am going to show you the impact of our machine the carbon impact of our machine so i'm going to show you the carbon impact using one percent of prologis's certified sustainable space so on our webs on uh, Prologis website, we found that 171 million square feet is used for uh, sust is uh, certified sustainable space. So I'm going to show you what will happen if I plant just one percent of that as bamboo. So that is one percent of that is 39 acres, where you can plant uh, 39,000 bamboo. So here in the machine, you can see there are 39,000 bamboo. And let, so this is the this shows the year and this shows the number of tons sequestered. So in one year, as you can see, it reduces about 1000 tons of bamboo and 1000 tons is about 167 elephants of carbon dioxide for bamboo. So you can see that this project is that bamboo is well suitable for uh, carbon removal. Now I'm going to show you the business model of the solution. So the first part is to find the perfect type of bamboo for that area. Then we have to check if there's a coal plant in that area. And our idea is if there's a coal plant, we are going to convert that coal plant into a biomass plant or else we'll just set up a new one. So the first phase is to find the perfect type of bamboo using this map here. So if you're in Australia, you can see, you can use Chesquia bamboo. If you are in India, then you can use Fargesia bamboo, etc. And then 
uh, if there's a coal plant, you can convert it into a biomass plant. So while the main, uh, the similarities both work the same way by converting steam to electricity. And the main difference is fuel. So the steps that we will be uh, needing to convert it is this, I'll just show you. So this is a game we made to show the steps required to change a bamboo, uh, a coal plant into a bamboo biomass plant. So in a typical coal plant, there are huge yards of coal, uh, uh, huge storage yards, which are used for storing coal in these conical structures here. So instead of plant, instead of keeping coal there, first step is to put bamboo and storage areas there. So you can see the simulation here. Instead of coal yard, we can keep bamboo as well as uh, storage facility. The second step is that right uh, coal plants usually use an oil insulator. So as I told you in the machine that inside uh, the factory that we had to uh, heat the coal to generate electricity. So to heat that, you, uh, most coal plants use an oil insulator, but that is harmful because it depends on oil and uh, fossil fuels again. So instead, we are going to use a solar insulator. This will keep it completely eco-friendly. And so you can see the simulation again. Finally, you can we have to convert the combustion system to be suited for bamboo. So you can see here that instead of that, we are converting the combustion system. And that's how you can convert the coal plant. And now, uh, as I told you before, that uh, we can that if there is no coal plant, we have to set up a new plant. So uh, setting up a new plant can use degraded land to grow bamboo. Degraded land will also become more fertile if you plant bamboo because it, you can plant it anywhere. Now I'm going to show you five ways this solution is different from others. Bamboo has a higher yield, so it covers less area, but generates more electricity. It is fully automated and no carbon monoxide is generated. And then no extra land is needed because we are reusing the coal yard for converting bamboo to plant bamboo, I mean. And also it reduces deforest. Uh, sorry, this was the old point. Sorry about that. And now the last part is bamboo versus coal. So if we want to replace coal with bamboo, then we have to uh, see whether it's, uh, what is the problem with that. So you can see that bamboo is less efficient than coal. So how are we going to solve this? Now we can convert bamboo logs into tiny pellets. And this will help, uh, will be much more efficient because it is, uh, it is, it uh, takes less space and also generates more electricity. And then we are also working on making the game. We are also working on making the game simulation and cost and power efficiency. And that's it. Thanks for listening. Thank you. So, so is this the part that I ask questions? Yes, please, Amit, go ahead. Please. Okay, I have two questions. One, uh, number one is probably the most important. What's the, what's the math around the amount of energy that goes into this process and its carbon impact versus the amount of uh, carbon that is extracted uh, from the atmosphere as a result of this uh, process? Have you done that calculation? Uh, could you just repeat your question? I didn't get you. Okay, so by burning the bamboo that you grow in a pelletized form, you're obviously generating more carbon dioxide in the yes. atmospheres. Um, but in growing the bamboo, you, you're extracting carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So have you done the total calculation to see what the net effect of that is? Is it positive or negative? Yeah, we have. Uh, I'll just uh, open the... Uh, the simulation here. So actually, uh, the we have an engine chip here, 
uh, which actually it's a call, it's called a function chip. So what it does is it um, subtracts the amount of amount of carbon that is generated from the carbon that is uh, sequestered, and so you get the overall net carbon impact of the solution. And we have the calculations here. This is actually a research paper we wrote uh, related to all the details. You can find the uh, details and the calculations uh, over here as well. Okay, and, got uh, it. Okay, and uh, the second question is, are there any limitations globally in terms of where you can grow bamboo? Um, I know there are different kinds of bamboo that grow different places, but are there places that you can't grow bamboo at all? Um, actually, there are some places like, well, some uh, places like Antarctic, Antarctica, of course, no plant can grow there. But other than that, uh, most of the places we have seen, we have tried to get at least one type of bamboo here. So actually... Uh, if you look at this map here, this Chescuia bamboo is for moderate climate and Fargesia is for a tropical climate. Tamno Calamus is for somewhat of a subtropical climate. And this Borinda bamboo is for the frigid zone. So actually none of this we have tested in reality, but according to the papers uh, that others have already written, we got the uh, conclusion that it can be grown here. Okay, I know I said I would ask two questions, but I have one other one too, which is, have you looked at the capital efficiency of this uh, system? In other words, um, uh, how much carbon do you extract from the atmosphere for each dollar of investment? Have you put dollars and cents to this, to this scheme? Uh, no, actually, that uh, that is something we are working on. We are thinking of what will be the cost of converting, what is the cost needed to run this. So we are still working on that. So maybe after working on that, we could share info about that. That would be great. And obviously, you would want to compare that to other solutions that are out there, like planting trees in the, in the Amazons or something. Yeah. Okay. Sounds like a really interesting uh, business plan. I mean, if the numbers work, this has got to be great. Uh, thanks. Fantastic. Jogan, one question, because you mentioned something that you used from the Prologis website. Can you explain a little bit more what was that number? And let's check with Hamid if it makes sense, the number you used for the area. What is this 171 million that you're showing? Uh, actually, on their website, I found a page called Environmental Stewardship Facts, and I found that 171 million of the storage area is, is a certified sustainable space. So I, I had a question, actually. So does this mean you reserve this place for sustainable activities, or uh, what does that mean? No, what it means is that the building features... Um, uh, were very sustainable. For example, we use recycled concrete or we have water collection systems that recycle rainwater, um, things like that, basically, uh, as opposed to using new materials and, and uh, generating more carbon as a result of that. So there's a process that you can go through to get certified. Uh, the most common one is LEED, which is L-E-E-D, uh, but there are other uh, organizations that certify buildings, including Gresby and the Green Building Council and, and other industry standards to look at sustainability of the building construction. Has nothing to do with the operation of the building, has to do with the construction of the building. The operations of the building uh, vary greatly in terms of their environmental impact because we lease the buildings to different kinds of people that do different things some of which have a high impact, some of which have no impact. Oh, okay. Thanks for the information. Also, sure. so I wanted to know how much area is vacant, like how much area is unused and you're still looking to plan, uh, you're still looking to do something there, something like that. So the total portfolio that we have is 1 billion square feet. 
Uh, so 175 um, uh, million square feet is about 17% of the total area. Usually our portfolio is about 96% occupied. You can never get it to 100% because there are always customers coming in and going out. So there's a void between people coming in and going out. So the most you can get occupancy is about 96%. But if there's need for more space, we're always developing new buildings to, to expand the portfolio. Oh, okay. So is that uh, like 4% of, uh, of the 1 billion square feet? Is that the vacant area or? Yes, it's 40 million square feet of vacancy. Oh, Which okay. sounds like a lot, but it's a big portfolio. Oh, okay. Thanks for the information. So Hamid, is that is that potentially like for example for the project they have, can that four percent get used to to grow bamboo for example, or that four percent have to be empty? No, that four percent you can't get it to be less than four percent empty because uh, between the time a customer's lease ends and a new one starts, you have to spend some time cleaning up the space and modifying the space for the next customer. Oh, okay, okay. So that represents the downtime between, um, between different customers coming in and going out. So it's very hard to get that number to be smaller. Okay. So it's, so, so so it's not really any... vacant. Sure, it's not really vacant. vacant. It's just not income producing for some uh, small period of time. Okay, understood. So you don't have room to have to get used for some sustainability project in your property. The property is 100% getting used for its function. It is, but we use the roof surfaces, for example, to generate renewable power. So oh. we're the third largest producer of, for example, renewable power, power in the US after Walmart and Target. So because we own, we own more roofs in the world than anybody else, so that's probably the, the best surface to, to use for sustainable activity, renewable energy. Fantastic. Thank you, man. That was very good. Thank you, Jogan. So let's go to next. Thank Stephanie, you. Stephanie, who is next? Next, we have the golden ratio. Hi. Uh, my name is Aliazi. I am from Oman. I am a grade 10 student and I am the CEO of Golden Ratio. We have team members from Azerbaijan, Palestine and India. And we are also working on carbon removal solution. And I will start by introducing you to this rock. Geologists had discovered a type of rock found in Oman and that can absorb the carbon dioxide. This carb uh, type of rock called birdetite, and it also can be found in uh, Babo, New Guinea and Caledonia. And how uh, can this rock be helpful? Uh, we must study these rocks and make an artificial rocks that works the same way this birdetite rock does, absorb the carbon dioxide. And then we can uh, build with these artificial rocks houses. We can't spread rocks all around the world just to help absorb the carbon dioxide emissions. That's why we have to study these rocks to and make an artificial rocks that works the same way. Um, this is our carbon removal machine. I will explain here more. So imagine if this building, for example, is built with these artificial rocks that absorb the carbon dioxide. There's definitely going to be a stored energy of carbon dioxide in it. So we are going to take advantage of that and send these uh, energy of carbon dioxide to factories to make um, a balance in reducing and producing the carbon, dioxide, uh, the carbon dioxide. So we have many questions that we are looking for their answer. We are doing more research to help find uh, their answers and improve the solution. Uh, question number one, what does it take artificially to reproduce the rock? We have to study how this rock works, how it converts the carbon dioxide and make an artificial rock. And then question number two, what would be the amount of CO2 it absorbed in a year? For example, one rock absorb one ton in a year. Question number three, what would be the rough cost? 
we have to see if the cost will, would be too high for a low efficiency. That would be not okay, not good. And question number four, what technologies can be used to take the stored energy of CO2 from the building? How are we going to absorb the um, carbon dioxide energy from the building and send it to factories? And this is basically it. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Uh, so what's the capacity of periodolite or whatever it's called in terms of absorbing carbon? In other words, does it get saturated at some point um, after it absorbs all the carbon it's gonna absorb? It does it reach a point of diminishing returns? Uh, can you explain more, please? I didn't get the question. Okay, so if you have a piece of this rock sitting around and there's carbon dioxide in the air, okay. the rock absorbs the carbon dioxide. But after a while, okay. it probably has absorbed all the carbon dioxide it can absorb, right? Yes, but the rock will, uh, we will take the, the stored uh, carbon dioxide from this rock and we send it to factories. So, so this rock can work again and again and again. So how do you extract the uh, carbon dioxide and what's the energy use in doing that to extract the carbon dioxide? Yes, that, that what are we looking for? We, are, we will conduct with the university probably this week to help gives us more information. Okay, great. Um, yeah, it's an interesting solution. Um, I, I, in all of these solutions, basically, um, there is energy going in to extract the carbon dioxide. And, and the key to all of this is to figure out net net at the end of the day, whether the balance is positive or negative. Yes. Yeah, and, and I mean, the, 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 because they build the simulation, one part of the simulation they build is that uh, production and, and, uh, and sequestering of carbon. Some of the solutions they're coming up with is kind of uh, not that easy. They need help of others to help them to understand better. Uh, they, they, it has been an amazing outreach that they had themselves uh, to various uh, universities and industries, even locally, like this one, which is in Oman. Actually, on Monday, there is, there is some uh, agencies there. They're going to have a meeting with uh, Aliaz's team to... Uh, to get some of the researchers which are local to work with them to do that. Uh, but I okay, think great. it's clear for them they need to find that uh, balance, yes. You know, it's interesting. In today's financial times, there is a video of the week, which I can send you the link on, which is a bunch of people at Stanford actually working on what they call an artificial tree which is an efficient form of extracting carbon using the same photosynthesis as a tree, wow. but it's much more powerful. And it's very related to this uh, topic that uh, your students are working on. So I will oh, send you the link. I'll, I'll send you the link. You can share it with them. Thank you. That, that, that would be great. It's, it's very much in line. Great. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie, who is the next company? Next, we have Shindel. Hello, my name is Ferris and I am from Palestine. We have team members from uh, Ireland and Kenya. And uh, I'm from Palestine, as I said. One second, please. This, uh, we are working on uh, the green city as it is supposed to be the Shindo city. The Shindo cities are environmental friendly cities. We are, we want to uh, turn every city into Shindo cities because Shindo cities are eco-friendly. As you can see, it works on solar energy. These cars are hybrid cars. It also works on uh, wind uh, energy. Our main, our main solution is the artificial tree. One, artific these artificial, uh, these are the artificial tree leaves, which are one thousand more efficient than true leaves. It is made out of resin that contains sodium carbonate that pulls the carbon and gets it down to the storage. 
According to research, one artificial tree can suck one ton of carbon dioxide every day. Now, as you can see here, the carbon in the air moves. When it touches the, the artificial tree, it sticks in its leaves and it gets down to the storage. And that is my, uh, my presentation. I hope you like it. Okay, got it. Um, so, um, so again, um, it's the same question as the other solutions. It's a common solution. Do you have any math around of what the net energy consumption is, how much goes in and how much comes out in, um, in doing this? In other words, um, to make the solar panels, you use energy, but the solar panels generate energy. Then that energy goes into your artificial tree, but the tree consumes energy to make that tree. So the question is net net at the end of the day, what's the energy impact of this, um, uh, this environmentally friendly city? Is it positive or is it negative? And what's the cost? Mm. According to research, uh, the artificial tree may cost $20,000 uh, $20, for an artificial tree, but if it can, maybe we can uh, recycle some tubes to make an artificial tree as it is the stand that goes to the, that makes it goes to the storage. Okay, so, so basically all these different solutions from the different teams at some point need to, need to get compared to one another to yes. figure out which one is the most cost efficient, right? So that's going to be an important factor. Yeah, De definitely. So uh, uh, Faris, first of all, what grade are you at? Fifth, going to sixth. You're going to sixth grade. Very good. So, and then in the in the research that you found, have you found any numbers about how much carbon, uh, you know, they, they, they take per day and what is the energy that it needs to do that? Have you found those two pieces of information? Um, I found information, but I don't think it is here. It is about how much numbers of these trees can suck. Uh, it says that 100 million of these trees can remove, like, uh... Okay, so we lost your sound, Faris. So what, what we should do is we are going, you know, as of next week, we are going to have one coach assigned to each of the companies and is going to review that with you because we have only eight weeks remaining. Now is the time to actually uh, make this more solid. Uh, you know, I want all of you know that the, the technologies or the processes you're looking at might not be easy, but that should not be a deterrent for you. You should, you should be okay with that. But we need to reach out to have some coaches which they know the area that each of you working on. So that's going to happen as of next week. And you remember, we asked to have one paragraph about your research. You go, you're sharing this with the, all the advisors you got, and we're going to find one that is more relevant and will work with you to make sure you have a next step. Okay, Faris? That was great, man. Thank you. Okay. Great. Okay. Let's go to, let's go to the next one, uh, Stephanie. Next, we have the Grand Poly Innovators. Hi everyone. Uh, uh, carbon uh, removal. Uh, about the team, uh, we need new ideas uh, to clean up carbon, which is a big problem for the world. Instead of destroying carbon, it should be used. I think we need both oxygen and carbon. We have a new and perfect idea for carbon cleaning. This idea is a graphene substance. Graphene is the hardest, best conductive and transparent substance. The substance is made of graphite. Graphene doesn't even pass through it. 
think about what we can do with this item. It's a really great item. The raw material of this substance is graphite. Graphite is made of carbon. Direction of the substance to heat and cold are different. Other substances expand in heat. Graphene expands in the cold. Graphene is a two-dimensional dimension, substance, has elasticity. Uh, can you see? It's a rigid, elastic, transparent, and conducts electricity very well. This is incredible. We can make great discovery with the material. This material is one time stronger. If we double it, it will be strong uh, than uh, we can imagine. We can use it in battle because it does uh, not carry bullets. We can make very strong armor, just like the superheroes in the movies. We can also uh, use graphene in the construction of spacecraft. I think that uh, science uh, to graphene, we will develop uh, new technologies. We can make phones or the screens from graphene. In addition, the graphene conducts and stores electricity very well. At the same time, we can develop long lasting and fast charging energy batteries. This phone uh, can uh, charge the battery in uh, five, 10 seconds. Energy will be depleted in seven, 10 days. This also applies uh, to electric cars. At the same time, the charging time of cars will be reduced to uh, 30 seconds or one minute, and it ends late. I have such an opinion. In 1979, Sir Arthur Clarke's book, The Paradise Waterfall, contained an idea called the cosmic elevator. However, a very rigid and transparent material was needed uh, to develop this idea. We can do this from graphene. Carbon is a very useful substance for us. We will both clean carbon and start a new era of technology. Today, my internet is very weak. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so Hamid, sorry, before, before your question, just one comment to give. Uh, you know, we, we discussed this once that the focus on the uh, on the carbon removal, uh, uh, you know, X Prize right now is really on showing the carbon removal uh, methods that are efficient. It means that the neg is negative, the total carbon, and what's the cost? They are not focusing on what to use that carbon for. So what you're showing is very important that you know that the carbon can be used for various. Uh, you know, uh, uses, but we want to make sure that each of you focus more on the, on what is the process of the sequestering the carbon and be efficient. So that helps you because it's a large project, focusing on all pieces would be harder, but if you only focus on sequestering carbon part, you can have a more in-depth solution. So just a general point. Sorry about that, Hamid. Go ahead, please. No, I, that was very much consistent with what I was going to ask. I, I would like to understand a little bit better how the conversion of carbon to graphene actually happens. I mean, what's the process by which that happens? Because if you can produce a strong material at the end of the day, there are lots of uses for that. For that. They can replace steel, which is a very carbon intensive activity, for example. So that's, that's what I wanted to understand more about. So Aridosh, is that clear for you? Something to look into? Uh, so Hamid, uh, English is also issue, is very brave of him that he present, but interaction is much harder. Uh, but we'll make sure that, that, that the message you had 
uh, you had, and, and he left the meeting because of internet problem, actually. We'll, we'll, we'll pass what you said. Uh, that's a very okay. good point. Yeah, thank you. So we have only 10 minutes remaining. Stephanie, if you have more companies, can we postpone that maybe to later and get some uh, time to Hamid to give us some overview? Uh, can you please do that? Is that okay, Stephanie? Sure. Okay, thank you. So Hamid, how about you share your thoughts and, uh, and then we'll see if the kids have any questions. Thank you. Uh, do you want me to talk about our company or about this project? Yeah, I mean, it, it would be good if you talk about your company and, and what, I mean, how does especially uh, relates to sustainability? If, if you can give them an idea that how a company is started from like, you know, two, one person, two person, three person now has such a large impact that journey understanding of that is very very helpful really appreciate it okay great um well it's it's going to be a little difficult to summarize 38 years of uh, a career in a few minutes but uh i would say that any successful business that i'm familiar with um uh has to have a sustainable competitive advantage um and when you say that most people think that sustainable competitive advantage only comes from unique technology or something. But um, our business is one of the oldest businesses in the world. It's the, it's the property business. There's not a lot of technology innovation in that business. There is some, but that's not what, where the uh, competitive advantage comes from. Uh, the advantage comes from really being able to execute better than other companies. And the key to execution is having a vision and a very good, strong culture. Because at the end of the day, execution is about, um, about people. Also, um, in, in the property business, in real estate, when I started about 40 years ago, there were no big national or global companies. So most of the properties were owned by small players with two or three facilities everywhere. And those were extremely inefficient operations because they didn't have scale. By being able to assemble scale um, to a billion square feet, we managed to basically drive down the costs of building these buildings, operating these buildings. So our customers were better served by being in our buildings versus other people's buildings. And over time, that advantage allowed us to be able to consolidate the rest of the industry. So sometimes innovation comes in terms of the business model or in terms of the way you execute or in terms of the way you finance something. It doesn't always come from a brand new technology because if you really look at it, uh, the most of the world is, um, is occupied by businesses that really are not using anything unique in terms of technology, but are leveraging off of one of these other factors. So our, our idea was very simple. Um, our logistics real estate is very important because if you look at anything in your room or anything you're wearing, it probably came through a warehouse before it got to you. Uh, there's almost nothing other than the internet that doesn't go through, the, uh, through a warehouse. Anything physical has to go through a warehouse. So about 15% uh, of the world's economy is tied up in logistics. And logistics is the business of getting uh, goods from point A to point B. And most people take that for granted. They think it sort of happens but they don't really think about what's involved. There's transportation involved, there's labor involved, there's inventory involved. So all of these things are things that happen in our buildings. And by being able to do this at scale, we've managed to create an advantage that reduces the cost of our customers in, in doing logistics um, of all these goods. So that's basically the simple idea and um, I can go on and on telling you about the details, but that's not really important. What I just told you is the important part. Uh, fantastic, uh, Hamid. Uh, and, and you know, uh, one, one of the things that a uh, couple of times they ask, I want to repeat the questions that the kids were asking. 
is that what what was like, you know, have you had any point that you failed and, and how you recovered from it? What did you learn from it? If you can share one with them, it would be great. Yeah, I don't think it is possible uh, to build anything worthwhile without failing. Uh, failing is the key to learning. And if you don't fail, that means you haven't tried hard enough to, to do something that's really different. So I think uh, failing is not only... Um, uh, a normal condition for a business, but is a necessary condition because that's how you actually improve your ideas. Um, no, no business plan that I know of has ever been executed according to the plan. People have business plans and it's really important to have a business plan, but it's also, but it's even more important to be able to adapt your business plan to what you learn from the mistakes as you try to execute that business plan. So yes, mistakes and failures are opportunities to learn. And I used to actually carry around with me in my briefcase, a big yellow sheet of paper, writing down all the mistakes that we had done over the years. Because when you build a very successful business, everybody tells you you're great and you're so smart and everything. And it's good to once in a while look at a list of all the things that you messed up to just keep your humility uh, in uh, fright, fright, uh, front and center. So don't be discouraged by making mistakes or failing. Those are just, it's not, uh, the, there's a very famous expression in Japanese. It's not about how many times you fall down. It's about how many times you get up. So as long as you get up one more time than you fall down, you're good. Fantastic. Thank you. Jogan, you had a question. Go ahead, please. Yes. So you told that the rooftops of buildings are used to generate electricity using solar panels. So will it be possible to plant bamboo instead? Because bamboo will not only generate electricity, but it will also reduce CO2, right? Yes, uh, and I don't know the answer to that question. That's something that you can look at, but probably putting bamboo on top of a building is not the most efficient place to put bamboo because if you think about it, you need to get water there, you need to get soil there. So that just makes it really expensive to do that on top of a building. It's better to do that on the ground uh, without using the top surface of the building. So yeah. The idea makes sense, but probably it's not as good as doing it at the ground level. Oh, okay. Thanks. Also, the, the, I had... The, go ahead. Yeah, I had another question. So uh, can the Innovation Hub consider you as an advisor and uh, have you uh, and ask help from you? Sure, but I'm not probably the best person to help you, but there are people in our company that know a lot more about uh, this particular area of renewable energy, and I'd be happy to introduce them to you. Okay, thanks. By the way, you, you had a very good presentation, and it made a lot of sense. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, Aliazi, go ahead, you had a question? Yes. Um, if our uh, idea, the rocks idea, is possible and we um, improve it and we have, in the future maybe, we have more inf information, uh, can we test it and where? Is it possible in the future to get help from your company to help test this product in areas, for example? Yeah, I mean, we build buildings out of concrete. So if you can uh, economically build them out of these rocks, uh, yes. I, I think that would be a good thing. But um, we need to look at the economics of that because you can do anything as long as you're willing to spend the money. But um, it may be too expensive to transport from where it naturally occurs to where we need it to build things. So uh, we need to do the feasibility on that, but uh, yeah, I mean, why not? If, uh, if it can be done economically, it's a good idea. I don't know also what the properties of the rock are in terms of insulation, 
in terms of other characteristics, in terms of strength, et cetera, et cetera. But all of those things need to be looked at. Okay, that's great. So Hamid, we are at 11. We don't want to get more of your time. It was uh, fantastic. We really appreciate it. We know you are very busy and, and this was immense help to all the kids here. As always. Well, thank you. Thank you. I learned yourself. a lot actually. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, man. We, we, we you. like bye your bye. support as always. Thank you. Have a great Thank day. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. So, uh, others remain here for a second. We want to review the next step. So, uh, first of all, uh, that that was that was fantastic. Uh, uh, you know, performance of the hub. Uh, you know, as you saw, uh, what who you talked to was actually the company that owns the properties and the storage facilities in most important ports in the world. So one of the, uh, you know, their uh, landlord uh, is basically they're the landlord of Amazon, for example. Amazon wanna ship anything anywhere in the world. They're working with them to have their facility to be able to put on the port with the ship, the, the goods, and then take it from there to all the homes uh, at the end. So a very, very unique opportunity. It's fantastic that he's, he offered the help. And you know, a couple of the solutions that discussed is actually makes sense even to see potential working with the company. So that was, that was fantastic. Uh, let, let us go back and uh, review a few things. We are now at, you know, we need seven weeks between now and, and submission of the proposal. So we need to uh, really focus on the solutions. There are two parts of this focus. One is to make sure we have the library elements that each of the solution needs to come as soon as possible. The other is to make sure that the, each of the solutions get to the basic points that got discussed today to know what is the cost of doing what you're proposing and what's the net effect of the carbon production versus uh, uh, sequestering. These are the two main points that each solution that wanna be viable to get submitted, we need to have. So now, uh, over the next few weeks, you're going to refine these two. The only way we can do this rapidly is to get help from those that need, they know these areas. To get that help, as I mentioned, what we need is we need one paragraph, not a very long one, one paragraph about each of these, uh, uh, each of the solutions. And we need, if you can, a one or two minute video about it. But time is getting late. So if you can send that the next day or so, and I mean day, in the next 24 hours, we'll put that included in the package you're sending to many advisors that you have asked them to become advisor and they agreed. So we need to do this as rapidly as possible such that by the time we get them to connect with you, review what you're doing, provide the help for you, do more research, you can really take it to the next level. Meanwhile, always whatever methodology you take, usually there are more papers and articles about it. And it's very important to divide those papers between your team and try to understand it as much as possible. Sometimes the papers are hard, that's okay. But as much as you can understand them, that would be useful. Again, laser focus. The focus is on sequestration. The focus of this challenge is not on translating or transforming that carbon that is sequestered to some valuable material. There are other challenges that focus on that. The focus that XPRIZE has is how much you can sequester out of the atmosphere per year. That's the main focus. So you need to focus on that and what's the cost of doing that. So let's be less worried about what do you do with that carbon when you sequester it. You may, you may mention you can do this or that, but just the mention, the focus is on sequestration. And we need over the next 24 hours from the, each of the solutions. So let me 
look at the solutions and share it here because if it's not there if the, the your company did not make uh, a note of the uh, solution is going to be late so we have one from super cable team yes it's is carbon capture using zinc in pcb and transforming into poly uh, terrain. so in this again uh, for super capable team the more important part is the carbon capturing uh, zinc ion pcp transforming into the other piece you don't need to focus on focus on the first part and you need to know how much and to how much can you sequester and how much is the cost in the case of the carbon capture using the next one ngi carbon capturing and converting useful items again the main focus you need to put ngi in on the carbon capture what's the method converting into useful items you don't need to be worried about right now is all about how much carbon what's the cost using bamboo as eco-friendly alternative again put the focus on sequestering that's the samurais poly innovator ocean poly plankton at least half of the earth okay so the poly innovators this is this is all about capturing so you need to know how much and what's the cost shindo decrease carbon using the number of the carbon removal artificial trees so focus all on the tree side and uh hamid mentioned there is a just a recent article came out out of stanford that they're talking about some artificial free tree this is actually it is an artificial tree but it does photosynthesis means that it does like a real tree so it's very good one i'll get the paper share it with you maybe that's a better one to focus on then poly innovators this is a small device it removes more carbon than wood it attracts atmosphere converted carbon into dry ice you need to focus on the on the you need to focus on the taking out turning the carbon into batteries is not as critical right now to focus on Golden ratio on the artificial rock is all about the cost of making artificial rock and how much. And as, as you heard, one of the main question is after you take this much, how this is renewable, meaning that the, the, the rock can take again and again. And the graphene part, again, is more important about graphene taking out and uh, how much carbon you take out and how, if your focus was about making it to other material let's re change your focus on some other aspect because that's not the focus of uh, of the project so that's the ones we have the other ones that don't write anything their assumption is right now they're not working on any solution so we have right now as a last con one two three four five six seven solution eight solutions over the next couple of weeks, if some of those solutions do not show to be very, are uh, very economical or don't take enough carbon, it's completely fine to reduce number of solution, but put all of our effort around the solutions that have the most impact. Don't forget, Innovation Hub is collaborating it's enough to win one solution that's huge success for all of you so what i'm going to do is now i'm going to take the solutions put in a spreadsheet i'm going to make a column which says what is the net carbon sequesters in a year for a given cost meaning that say per thousand dollar for example how much carbon per year can be taken out? And the cost, usually there are two parts. One is the initial cost, like build a factory or something. And then one is ongoing cost because you need energy or something that produces. it. And then you're going to compare these two, meaning that we wanna see what solution has the most carbon taken out for a given cost? That solution is the most efficient. We want to find out that. We want to work on that kind of the solution. If we can make the whole hub focusing on that, 
that would be fantastic. We want to read every paper, every element, everything about it, such that we win the, the prize. It might be two solutions that both look good or three solutions. Then we keep three solutions. But don't forget, the hub is working as one all together to make the success. Because as soon as you know what solutions are the best, all other companies can help on libraries, can help on getting that solution out. They can make more machines about it. They can make games about it. How to make more awareness. So very, very rapidly, we want to focus on solutions which have a lot of legs, meaning that we know we can uh, support it. We know we can uh, stand behind it. And everybody else try and jump in and help it. So any question anybody has about this, the process we go in the next two weeks. One, we need one, one paragraph. And if you can, a video in the next 24 hours. If you cannot make a video, it's fine, send a paragraph. But you need to send one paragraph about what your solution is. In the solution, everybody's question is only two things. How much carbon for what cost you can take off? And if you don't know the answer, you should exactly say, you're looking somebody help us on this to find the cost or on this to find how much carbon. Ask, tell what your, your question is, such that when we send it out, we can bring people that can specifically answer your questions. And don't worry about what you do with that carbon and what kind of value you can get out of that carbon. That one, just mention this carbon is in this form or something, and then the value will come. That, that's that's uh, something which is not the main point of this competition, this X prize of Elon Musk. Any questions? Is that clear? Any comments or questions on what I said? Uh, yes. So for this, uh, could you add also a, a column for the area used? Because sometimes the solution could be uh, so uh, could take up so much space that it might be impractical. So maybe we need to look in that also. Very good. I'll do that. That's a good point. But don't forget that the area will show itself in the cost also. So if you want oh, to have okay. a place that you put bamboo in, you need to consider some kind of a rent for that area. Does that make sense? Yeah, actually so, uh, for the bamboo one, we are just going to reuse the coal, yeah, the coal collection area, the uh, previously used one. So we are okay. not going to use the new uh, area for that. Then, then it should fit there. Then in your calculation, you have some rough estimate of how much yard it is. Yeah, okay. it's uh, 150 uh, acres, which is about 150,000 bamboo. And it, uh, and it actually exceeds the, uh, exceeds 1,000 tons. Oh, that's very good. That's very good. You see, you have that. The cost of it already considered. Now you need only the cost of, you know, planting the bamboos, growing the bamboos. You have to consider those costs also, correct? Because, you yeah. know, they, they need water, for example. So, so you have to make sure that the cost is considered and then, then, then the, uh, the, the other points about the energy production that you have. So it seems in your case, Jagan, focusing on, on repurposing the, uh, the uh, coal plants is, is actually the winning one because you have the yard also as your, as your area, correct? Yeah, the only problem is in uh, the simulation, I'm not actually able to show the uh, amount of carbon sequester. It's actually so big that the graph, the uh, carbon meter cannot show. So, okay. and also I'm not getting how should I extend it. So I need so, some help. So on this the one, solution. this one, Mohammed, can you, you and, and maybe Don help on having a new library element such that we don't have this issue, please? So, so we'll, we'll get that. We'll, we'll address that.